You're on, Wendy. Go ahead. Okay. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is our first webinar with Dr. Fishman and Dr. Ron Weiss. And I just want to introduce both of them for those who might not be familiar with one or the other. Dr. Fishman is a medical director of Manhattan Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in New York City. He's the author of 10 books and author or editor of more than 70 academic articles. He's a lifelong yoga practitioner who integrated yoga into medical treatment with major discoveries for healing osteoporosis, back pain, arthritis, scoliosis rotator cuff syndrome, performance syndrome, and many other ailments. His program, Promising and Reversing Bone Moss, has been published with proven findings for effectiveness in more than 200 teachers, are certified instructors in his method. Thank you so very much, Dr. Fishman, for working with us this evening. We can't wait to hear what you have to say this evening. And for those of you who are familiar with Dr. Fishman, but not Dr. Weiss, Dr. Ron Weiss is a dual board certified internal medicine doctor of life med uh, lifestyle medicine and primary care physician in New Jersey. He's the founder of Ethos Primary Care and is a professor of clinical medical at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. He offers a medicine approach to healing from chronic illness and optimizing wellness. Dr. Weiss is the founder of the Ethos Farm Project, a semi-finalist in the Rockefeller Foundation for 2015, Food System, Vision Prize competition. He's featured in top media, including the New York Times, New York Post Today Show, New Jersey Monthly, and featured length documentary, Eating You Alive. His primary care practice in New Jersey is located on a 342-acre farm, which employs conscientious, chemical-free farming methods to restore the vitality of the land. The farm's bounty is available to patients and local community through a doctor's market, and you can go to ethosprimarycare.com to learn more. Dr. Weiss, can you please tell us a little bit about lifestyle medicine for those who aren't familiar, and then how it integrates with bone health? Definitely. Um, it would be my pleasure. So this is a subject very close to my heart, and, and um, I feel that I need to give our audience a little explanation because the term lifestyle medicine probably is fairly unknown to most uh, of our audience tonight and to most Americans. But the specialty of lifestyle medicine um, and it is the newest medical specialty that there is. It is a boarded specialty, just like cardiology is, and just like physiatry is. Dr. Fishman's a physiatrist, just like internal medicine and gastroenterology is. The lifestyle medicine uh, deals with the actual practical aspects of health. You know, uh, people often talk about our healthcare system and how degraded it is and how it doesn't work either from the financial aspect, the insurance aspect, the, the level of chronic disease that we have in this nation. We spend all this money on it, but we're certainly not the healthiest nation in the world, far from it. And so I really think of it not as really having a healthcare system, we have a medical care system. Uh, all the trillions of dollars, the $3.4 trillion we spent last year, 86% of it was spent on sustaining people in states of chronic disease through medications, procedures, and surgeries. That's why I call it the American medical care system. And what lifestyle medicine delivers really is true health care. And the reason why it does that is because it focuses on causation of chronic illness 
and addresses it and remediates it through the behaviors of in the, in the, the individual. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to the founder of Western medicine, who is Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, he was the first Western physician. Uh, he wrote that food is the most powerful medicine. Let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food. And as it just so happens, many, if not most of the chronic illnesses that we have, except perhaps for osteoporosis, which we're gonna hear about tonight, but most of them, including the top six causes of healthcare, uh, medical care expenditure in the United States, the heart disease, the, the vascular, cardiovascular disease, heart and stroke, the cancers, the Alzheimer's disease, the diabetes, the chronic lung disease, the chronic kidney disease, um, all of these diseases are food-based. So uh, lifestyle medicine as its first task of seven tasks it, 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 it seeks to address with patients addresses diet and nutrition first and foremost. But there are six other sectors which lifestyle medicine deals with. And the next one is fitness. And that's where yoga fits in. Uh, the third is emotional health. And uh, because yoga is a mindful practice, you could even argue that uh, yoga has so some domain in addressing emotional health as well. Then the next sector of lifestyle medicine is social connection. Number five is sleep. Number six is the avoidance of hazardous substances, such as uh, smoking, alcohol, and, and drugs. And the last is connection to the natural world. So what we do with patients in a lifestyle medical practice is uh, many patients come in with chronic illnesses like hypertension or diabetes, or they're overweight, or they have rheumatoid arthritis, or they have heartburn or they have psoriasis or acne or Hashimoto's you know, thyroid disease. And what we do is we address each of these uh, elements in their behavior to bring about reversal of their disease. And if you don't have the disease yet, then prevention. So that's what lifestyle medicine is all about. Um, and, you know, I want to target tonight's um, conversation, of course, because we have the world's foremost uh, professor and individual when it comes to yoga and its applications in, the, in treating and preventing osteoporosis, Dr. Fishman. Uh, so let's get back to the fitness portion. Um, and this is where I, I'd like to engage Dr., uh, Dr. Fishman a little bit on the importance of yoga in maintaining fitness. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that and then perhaps go further to talk about osteoporosis. Oh yeah, I'm happy to do that. Wait, I'll, I'll make myself big here so you, other people can see me. I think that's a good thing to do. Um, yes, I mean, you can, you can ask the question, fit for what? Because you want to know what people are interested in doing. You know, being fit to swim across the English Channel is good, but not necessarily the virtues you want if you want to be fit to sit in an office chair for 40 years. So you have to ask fit for what? And then the, the greatest, big, biggest answer to that is, are you adaptable? And it's interesting. There's a study that came out July 1st, a week ago yesterday, showing that the kind of stretches that you're going to see Liz doing later, I mean, exactly that stretch, with the unpronounceable name Suptapadangustasana. That pose has been shown to increase the flexibility of your blood vessels, to reduce their tortuosity, which is how much they wind and wiggle like an ancient river, and how much they can be distended without any harm, and how well they conduct blood along their channels. And it turns out, by stretching one leg, you also increase exactly those qualities 
in the other leg, even though no one has stretched the other leg. That lasts six weeks. In the leg itself, they tested it at six weeks and they tested it at 12 weeks. It just seems to endure. But not only does it work in a part of the body that was not stretched, it seems to work in the arm as well. Clever, clever Italian people who did the study measured those characteristics. So I think the, the greatest thing you could say about yoga is that it stimulates your ability to be adaptive. That sort of qualifies it for come what may. Wonderful. That was a wonderful explanation. And so how can we apply yoga now to somebody who already has a low bone density or does not want to get, get osteoporosis or osteopenia? No, that's, a, that's what we do. Um, you know, that, I'm going to talk about that in the little talk I've prepared to give. Shall I just launch into that talk? Let's see. It's just about time, and then we give have more time afterwards. Uh, would you? Shall I do that, Ron? Would you like? I mean, unless you have any uh, questions. The main event. <laughs> what? The main okay. event. Okay. Okay. Here I go. I'm going to make this into a, a a PowerPoint. I hope. Let's see if I can get the right thing up here. And of course, we're going to be taking, we'll take all questions, right, at, uh, at, in the last segment, if anyone has any questions regarding any topic, whether it be lifestyle medicine or uh, adaptability in yoga or osteoporosis. No, my goodness, the thing I'm looking for isn't here. Let's see, it's what a, what a, what a catastrophe. Uh, hold on just a minute, maybe I can find it somewhere. But it looks like it's not, if not, I'll just wing it and, and, and say it, uh, I'll just give the talk anyway. Your question is a very good one, and I can answer it. Uh, let's see. Well, it really doesn't seem to be here. Let me just try this one, see what happens with it. No, that's my email. Um, hmm, let me try one thing, because I did prepare it, and it would be nice to show you all. So I'm going to move something. This will take a moment. I, know, I notice people are much more forviving uh, when it's when it's a question when it's during this COVID period, everybody Pretty knows we're working from our homes. And uh, here it is. Let me just start it up. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it, but can you see that? Can you see that I just put up something called osteoporosis? Uh, my screen is dark. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess you're not seeing it then. Okay, let me let me go back to it. I'll try. One more time, and if I don't do it, I'll just talk to you guys. I'll just tell you the story. Um, one moment, please. I have to sign in again. My computer says host has disabled screen sharing. Oh, no, I didn't really do that, but it may look that but way. It says you have started screen, Dorn Fishman, MD. Yeah. So I'm confused. Yeah, I'm a little confused too. Well, I'll, I'll just try to get back well, to it. I think I ought to be able to do it. I, I have a suggestion. If, if you would, if you need a five minutes or so to maybe figure out what's wrong. Uh huh. If if you think there's a hope of getting your. Yes, uh, I think there is a hope. Yes. Stream back. Maybe I could I could take any questions that people may. Oh, go have. ahead. That's a good idea. Right. Go right yeah. ahead. Yes. Uh, if um. Carol and, and uh, Wendy, if, if you can, if you can, uh, if anyone has any questions that you can uh, gather about lifestyle medicine. Well, no, no I, I came back. I'm not, I'll try one more time right now, Ron. It might not work, and then I'll just talk. I can I can talk without the thing. And it looks like what I tried to do just now. Is it possible, Dr. Weiss, that intermittent fasting will help treat osteopenia? Did you hear me? Yes, I did. Um, I Susan Brown, that's Susan Brown's question. Right. I, I wouldn't, you know, I guess anything is possible, but I don't see the physiologic basis for why it would. Um, uh, you know, there are many different kinds of intermittent fasting. So 
uh, the intermittent fasting for those of the, those of you who don't know it means not eating for a small for a, a a relatively small period of time which can be anything from eight hours a day to 12 hours a day to maybe fasting for a day or two per week uh, then of course there are long-term water fasts which go on for weeks um, but uh, I can't imagine that there is any any benefit that can be brought to bear as far as bone health from fasting. In fact, there are some studies that have shown that when people fast for longer periods of time, um, for at least a week, actually that they they their um, their muscle mass decreases. They have muscle atrophy, and we know if that occurs because there's less force pulling on the anchors into the bones, that perhaps that could have a deleterious effect on bone density. Okay, I'd like to say something about that too. I mean, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do my presentation, but to tell you the truth, what's on that presentation, I know so well, I can do, I just, you just have to look at me instead of the pretty pictures. I'm terribly sorry about that, that's the way it'll be. But I have something to say about the fasting because there are a number, I mean, the best study I ever saw was one where they took three groups of rats one group they just fed what they normally feed rats and they ate the way rats eat. Second group, they gave him only 500, only 50% of their regular caloric intake every day, day after day after day. And the third group, they gave 100% of what they normally eat on Monday, but nothing on Tuesday because they fasted on Tuesday. Then 100% of what they eat on Wednesday and nothing on Thursday. So if you added up how many calories they got in the week, they were the same as the second group. The second group, eating half as much as the first group, lived about 30% longer on the average. That's the mean. The, the, the third group that got the fasting every other day and still the same nutritional intake lived 50% longer. Now you might ask yourself, well, what's going on here? And their ex the explanation of the gerontologists and uh, the nutritionists and physicians at, at NYU, this was their and I've heard this explanation uh, several times since, is that when you don't eat for that length of time, your body begins to devour, begin to metabolize the detritus, the sort of the garbage that's in your cells, the, 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 the times that DNA produced a protein that is useless, the times the DNA produced a protein that is actually harmful. And that, you know, instead of purging yourself by giving yourself some kind of a laxative, you're actually purging your individual cells, all trillion of them, by fasting. Now that sort of uh, falls in line with what you say about people losing their muscle mass. I I'm sure that's true. And they too are beginning to digest themselves. The cells are digesting themselves. And so for the purposes of osteoporosis or for being the world heavyweight champion, it's not gonna do you much good. Uh, but in terms of actually living longer, it appears to have a distinct advantage. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, very I interesting. There are many studies that show that calorie restriction across many different animal models prolongs lifespan. Mm -hmm. the, one, the one caveat to that study that I was mentioning did show that if people engage in fitness, in exercise during the fast period, they may be able to maintain their muscle mass so that it doesn't that it's, well, it's that's not, interesting. So their organs probably suffer somewhat and their muscles yes. retain their vibrancy. That's interesting. Right. However, I can, you know, we, uh, we do, we do in our practice, uh, do uh, guide people through uh, long-term water fasting. And, uh, you know, it's usually advised to stay calm and really not do too much as far as rigorous exercise is concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a risky it's a risky thing. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. And the water is something you really can't do without. There, there, yeah. there are no studies needed for that. Yes. So, so let me, uh, unless you have another question, uh, I'll, I'll launch into my talk. I found one key slide that somehow didn't disappear. This, is, this happened to me once before when I first started doing Zooms. It, it played tricks on me, but it played another trick on me tonight. So we're going to talk about yoga and osteoporosis. And one of the big things to know is, well, what is osteoporosis? And what it is, is the silent attrition or weakening of bones. It's painless, it doesn't make any noise, and you really don't, didn't know you had it until you broke a bone. 
Now we have x-rays and even more sophisticated devices that can determine whether your bone mineral density is normal or below normal. And the most important score there is the T-score. The T-score compares your bone mineral density with that of 25 to 30-year-old women, and not just a couple of them. They tested over 100,000 of them. And there are norms. There's a bell-shaped curve that tells you what's normal. And then if you go to about 80% over to one side, so that 80% of the people who were tested have better bones than you do, that's osteopenia. That's a made-up diagnosis by the World Health Organization not in order to fish you into the hospital, but rather to warn you, give you some uh, alert that you're about to get osteoporosis if you keep doing what you're doing. Then if your bones are weaker than 99% of the healthy 25 to 30 year old women, then you have osteoporosis. That's two and a half standard deviations beyond the norm. And that's down in the 1% category, way over in the tail of the bell-shaped curve. And if you have that, we physicians are somewhat uh, uh, apprehensive and we say, well, you'd better start taking one of those medicines. And in fact, the medicines do raise your bone mineral density. And raising your bone mineral density, they do correlate with a lower fracture risk, significantly lower, maybe 20% lower. And that's good. But the medicines themselves are not good. They have many, many side effects. At one point, uh, I took my MacBook Air and a uh, 12-point type. I listed all the, all the different side effects that there were to the medicines. Oh, things like swelling, the peeling of the face, um, uh, atrial tachycardia. Um, they're gastrically drastic. You have to stand up for an hour after you eat them. They're associated with eye problems, such as scleritis and episcleritis. Uh, recent studies find that, in fact, while they do strengthen your bones, they are also contributory to fractures of the bones. They make the bones more, as they say, brittle. It doesn't sort of fit in very well. It, it slows down your healing, too. And maybe worst of all, you can only take them for five or six or seven years, so that while your bone mineral density generally does rise with them, the moment you stop, you have a precipitous drop. Now, you don't drop back to where you were when you started. You don't drop back that far, maybe half that far, a third of that far. But you can't take the medicines anymore. So there are a number of reasons not to take them. Now, you might ask, well, there's one other one I have to mention because it is probably the most dreaded. It's called osteonecrosis. And the name suggests that the bone dies, and that's just what happens. Usually, it's the jaw. But I've seen several cases in the knee as well the inside of the bone dies. Now, how does that happen? It happens because, well, I wish I had a slide here. There's the center of the bone where there is a blood vessel, and then there are many cells around it that are secreting bone at first and then sustaining the bone. These cells around it get their nutrition, their glucose, their proteins, their hormones, and, and they get in oxygen, and they get rid of the uh, 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 products of metabolism, lactic acid, for example, through their circulation with the blood vessels. However, there are not that many blood vessels in bone. It wouldn't be very strong if there were. So here's one cell, here's another cell, here's another cell, here's another cell. How does this cell get oxygen and glucose and so forth from this blood vessel that's so far away? Answer, these cells are, they look like Portuguese man of wars. Here's a, a, such a cell, and then down from it comes a, a broad braid of tentacles. And where do those tentacles reach? To the next cell, and to the next cell. And so from this central blood vessel, there's like a Congo line of cells, taking a little bit of the oxygen for themselves and passing the majority of it on. So that these Congo lines are up to 11 cells long. So a cell way out here is getting nutrition from this blood vessel by virtue of that Congo line. So now the question is, what happens when one of the cells in the Congo line dies or gets sick and can no longer support that function? Answer, all the cells beyond it would wither and die, except that there are cells in the body called osteoclasts, large cells with 50 nuclei. 
You ever see that movie Independence Day, those gigantic ships that surrounded Washington, D.C.? That's what they look like. They're gigantic. And they're very powerful. They secrete hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid in such a way that they can dissolve bone. Now think about it for a second. What can dissolve bone? You can go to the catacombs in Rome and you see bones 3,000 years old. They withstood the weather, the worms, and everything else. And yet these little tiny cells are able to do it. Yes, they are. But then why did the good Lord put them there? If they're just there to dissolve the cells and we're worried about osteoporosis and these cells are dissolving the protein and the uh, minerals and returning them to the systemic circulation, why? Well, nature had a reason. Nature didn't put them there because she had no better place. She put it there because that was a very good place. Because when this cell dies, the cell that's say number four on the Congo line, the osteoclasts come in, eat up that cell, and secrete enough substances that attract new cells to come in there and replace it. So the Congo line becomes intact again. Now, when you take these medicines, the most popular of the medicines, there are a couple of others that are good in many ways. They have side effects too. But the most popular medicines, they suppress these osteoclasts, these cells that go in and eat up the diseased and dead cells and make sure that there's a new one. They suppress them. So, I mean, you do the math. Here are the cells making new bone. Here are the cells eating up that new bone and returning the elements back into the, the system. So you're making just as much, but you're eating up less. What's the result? If you have a bank account and you're making the same amount of money, but you're selling, you're spending less, what happens? You end up with savings. And if these cells are making the same amount of bone and less cells are dissolving it, you end up with more bone. Hence, your bone mineral density gets higher. And that's how it works. It's as simple as that. However, because the fourth cell in the Congo line dies and is not replaced, whole sheets of cells further out than that will also die. And pretty soon, there can be such a thing as bone death. Enough of the bone dies sometimes so that there is this osteonecrosis, or enough of the bone dies or is sufficiently weakened that the bone will break. The first case of that was a doctor at NYU was hanging onto the com commuter cord on, on a train, fell to the ground and with a resounding crack. And when she got up, she said, I fell down and broke my hip. But the other people around her on the train in those pre-COVID days said, no, no, doctor, you didn't fall and break your hip. You broke your hip and fell. We heard the crack long before you hit the floor. And now there are, you know, cases all over the country, you know, class actions against these companies because there are many people that have actually sustained fractures because of the medicines they're taking to avoid fractures. This is not progress. So now what yoga does is just the opposite. Yoga doesn't decrease the cells that are eating up the bone. Yoga works by increasing the cells that are making the bone. So the same math applies. You're making more money and spending the same amount. So you have more money in the bank. And that's the way this seems to work too. Now, how does yoga do it? Yoga does it by strengthening uh, the pressures on the bones. Yoga does unusual things to the bones. It pulls them in unusual ways. Uh, a man named Everett Smith at the University of, uh, of Shetland in, uh, in England, he did a study on turkey wings, where one turkey wing was bound down and the other turkey wing had very unusual pulls, as you would imagine, from a turkey with one wing. And that turkey wing got much stronger, got much better bone mineral density than its fellow on the other side. And indeed, that is what yoga does. It's called Wolf's Law. Wolf was a, a, a physician and a surgeon and an anatomist back in the 19th century and a uh, um, engineer at, at Cologne, Cologne was building a big crane. He wandered into a natural history museum and found that he went, mein Gott, the uh, bones of a vulture's wing that he saw displayed in the natural history museum had exactly the same configuration is what he was doing for the head of the crane. He wrote a little article about it and um, Wolf read it, Julius Wolf took, took a look at it and said, I see this all the time. He sees it all the time. Bones have a tendency to grow and get stronger just where they're stretched and strained. And so he formulated what is not coincidentally known as Wolf's Law, which is that the architectonic of a bone 
the lines of force, you know, the, the, what, what supports the bone, follow the lines of force to which the bone is exposed. And this has now been proved down to the atomic microscope level, way beyond uh, your, your normal uh, uh, means of, of investigation. And it seems to be true that the, the pressure stimulates a, 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 a twisting or a bending or a stretching or a compression of the bone, which deforms the membrane of the bone, which gets transformed by the membrane, this brilliant membrane of the cell, into an electron volt, which powers a reaction inside the cell to form a new molecule, which wafts its way down to the nucleus, enters the nucleus, upregulates certain DNA, downregulates other DNA, and that cell, which was this, just there to sustain the bone, suddenly changes back into the kind of cell you had when you were nine years old. It starts making bone. How many seconds do you have to expose it? Somewhere between 12 and 72 seconds. That's They've even gone that far. The obsessive compulsive sciences have gone to quantify it like that. So now, compared to the side effects of the drugs, which you heard a few of, I don't know if I finished telling you it, with 12 point type, it was 14 inches of, of um, side effects. You know, mm, convulsions. I can go on rashes on the face. Yeah, I can go on and on, but I won't. So what are the side effects of yoga? Well, better balance, better posture, increased range of motion, fortified strength, refined coordination, lower anxiety. Yes, there are medicines you can take that will lower your anxiety, but they impair your balance. So what does that matter? It matters because the principal ways that you get an osteoporotic fracture are through crummy posture and falls. Yoga improves your posture and it mitigates against falls with all those other factors, increased strength, wider ranges of motion, um, better balance, less anxiety, superior coordination. And now, because of what I told you uh, when Ron and I talked about it a minute ago, what, how does yoga make you more fit? It also means decreased strokes and decreased heart attacks because your blood vessels are more adaptable, more flexible, better able to carry the pulse your heart generates in time. So what does that really mean? Oh, also I should say, what's the cost, you know, in dollars of osteoporosis to the United States in a year? It's about 31 billion as of 2016. Now, what is the cost of a yoga class and in its divine wisdom, Medicare has decided not yet to pay $75 for a yoga class. Um, a really interesting study was done by Ethel uh, Cyrus, S-I-R-I-S, who's the head of a, a very august clinic at Columbia, where I teach, Columbia Medical School, where they do this stuff. And she wrote an article. She looked at all the people that joined Medicare in, I think it was 2014, all of the ones who joined, who had two characteristics, they had osteoporosis and they had Medicare Part D. So the medicines weren't gonna cost them any money. So how many people were there in this group who were prescribed the medicines? 127,000, wow. Of that 127,000, only 25, 20, no, it was 27, 27,000 of them took them, even got the prescriptions. They're so afraid of these, medicines, and, and I think, you know, reasons, rationally so. They're, they're, they're fearsome. So what does it mean? It means we are generating a national health crisis, a, a, a public health issue, and more pervasive than, than the COVID. I mean, there will be 55 million people with osteopenia or osteoporosis. And if you get it, if you fracture your hip, you have a 25% chance of passing away you have another 25% chance of entering a nursing home from which you will never emerge. And the other 50% do return to the lives that they had before the fracture. So the mortality is higher than COVID. Uh, the incidence is, is far higher, 20 times higher. And no one's racing out for a cure, except us. The yoga seems to work extremely well. We did a study. I, 
I got excited about it. I had a fire in my belly and I did a little pilot study and my son came by and looked at the data. And I, he said, are you gonna publish this dad? And I said, no, it's never gonna be statistically significant. And he said, give me the data. So I gave him the data, it was really easy to do. He went upstairs and came back five minutes later. He said, dad, it's significant. So it was very hard to publish. People didn't believe it at first, but they did. And then it uh, got published and I got really excited about it. So I made a thousand copies of a DVD and just gave it away to people who uh, had osteoporosis and were willing to do it for the next two years. So we compared what the people, what happened to their bone mineral density in the two years before they joined the study. Guess what? It was going down. And with the two year period when, from when they started the study till their next DEXA scan two years later. So everybody was in the study in it in a way for four years. They only had to do two years of yoga to be in it. And in those last two years, 82% of them gained bone mineral density. Uh, some, not everybody did, and not all terribly dramatically, but when you looked at it, it certainly stopped them from getting worse, which in a way is the greatest triumph of all. But secondly, actually raised the bone mineral density. Now, let me go to the screen share because I think that's the one thing I just saw on the pictures there. Let's see if it's still there. <laughs> no, they took that one away from me too. But anyway, uh, that's, that's uh, one where, uh, I wanna get rid of this now. That's, it, it really does show the hip, the femur, and the, oh uh, uh, wait, I don't wanna share it, I wanna quit. Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Fishman. I have the PowerPoint up if you allow me to screen share. Oh, I sure will. Yeah. Who is that? Wendy. Is Wendy? Oh, great. Your screen. You're, you must be at a distant location. It doesn't come in as well, but here, I'm making you the host. You're being the host. Now, don't forget to give it back to me when the time is right, but let's see. We're on about slide 27, something like that. Are you, I, I should have made you the host now. You have, now you have to say something to take over. I'm sharing okay. now, coming up to okay. the PowerPoint. There it is. Okay, but I can't do it. You have to do it. Keep going up. Go up. up. You, you got That's the right thing. I'm going to have to get a tutorial from you, Wendy. You're really good. Can't do this because, oh, man. Wendy is our renaissance woman. Yeah. Always ready to. Not only renaissance, but she sort of fits into the 21st century. Yeah. Okay, that's really good. Now go, go forward a lot. Oh, These are all the people on this slide are all the people that helped me with this. Uh, there are many people here. Keep going, going, going. That shows the DEXA. That's the bell-shaped curve. This is how well the medicines work. They really do work. Keep going. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I'm showing. Uh, all right, go ahead, keep going. The argue, yeah, we did that. Talk about this, keep going. Stop it, oh. Yeah, go back one slide. I wanna show something. Can you go back? Yeah, uh, this is on the left here. You see what all of our bones look like at birth. Short, fat, straight little arrows. But over the course of candlelivering and walking by the age of three, our bones have begun to get that characteristic crook in them. Then by five years, it's pretty well settled. There's that uh, 60 degree angle. Now this is not that the bones do this automatically, the way you automatically grow pubic hair when you're 12. It's not like that. Paraplegics, those unfortunate children that never walk, at age five, their bones are still straight. It's a real exhibit of Wolf's Law. It's the pressure on the bone that causes the bone on the inside of that angle to grow and the pressureless part on the outside of that angle uh, to, to shrivel away and, and get and atrophy. Okay, now let's go on. Now I'll stop there. Let's say, here's what yoga does. With this bend like this, you can see what a tremendous mechanical disadvantage the thigh bone is on in the right leg. So it's getting an awful lot of pressure there, which is making it stronger. Now what you do in this pose is you turn your left side far away from the right thigh. So there's torque at the femoral head and, uh, and where the thigh bone goes into the pelvis. And the vertebrae are also twisted, giving them some you know, significant stimulus to grow. Go ahead, to get stronger. Go ahead, go, go ahead, Wendy. Um, uh, uh, can you put me on for a second? I wanna show something. Just undo the screen share for a second. I, all right, yeah. 
Okay, now some people ask this question. Oh, you're not, you're not on me yet. Some people ask the question, you know, take that off so it shows, you know, me the person. It may be hard to do. Boy, this is Raggedy Andy, but we are doing it. Okay, there I am. Now, some people ask the question, yeah, but how can doing a, the exercise work, you know, we have gravity. The answer is our muscles are many times stronger than gravity. We can generate forces far in excess of what gravity can even hope to accomplish. You say, what? Our muscles are stronger than gravity? I say, yes. And well, how can you prove that? And I say, are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> of course our muscles are stronger than gravity. What's the whole point of having a muscle? Maybe on Jupiter they're not stronger. I don't know, but here, that's the whole point. Okay, now let, you want to go back to it? I, I can really just finish up. I mean, I'm, I'm almost there, I think. Um, I'm trying to say that yoga is better than the medicines. Each of the medicines, however concocted it is, including the new eventity, all of those medicines have significant and formidable side effects. Whereas yoga, its side effects are beneficial effects. There, is a, 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 there was another group of European scientists who did an unusual thing. They um, took cadaver bones, spinal bones, they drilled little holes in them, and then they inserted pressure gauges. And they accounted for the weakening of the bone by virtue of the hills they, holes they drilled. So it's a pretty good study. And then they measured what happened when they did all kinds of things. I mean, it looked like something out of Dr. Frankenstein's lab, you know, with wires all over the place. And they embedded these vertebrae in cement so that they were stable. And then they pressed straight down on them. They went off to this, off to that side, off to the back, off to the front. They twisted it one way and then the other to see what happened with the forces inside, exactly to be able to predict which forces would be useful in generating new bone. And they found that the twists, which certain uh, people who work in osteoporosis say, oh, whatever you do, don't twist. That in fact, the twists were very valuable for generating new bone right along the front of the periphery, right along what's called the vertebral body, right in the front of the vertebrae. And what does that matter? Because that's where the fractures occur. And it's the most common kind of fracture. And if you have good posture and you do a little bit of this twisting every day, you're much less likely to have a fracture. I mean, significantly less. The neighbors don't bump on your ceiling with their broomsticks. You haven't done anything to anybody, but you've helped yourself. So now I did have this slide, which is there. Wendy, you wanna go back to the slides for the one? This is like near the end. We're gonna go back and forth a little bit. You were so good at doing it. You want to go back and we'll just go on and I want to show one more slide and then basically I'm almost done. Yeah, those are good, but go, go back up about 10, five or 10 slides. Keep going. There, stop there, stop there. Uh, it's number 29. Oh, oh, stop there, let's do this guy. Here is a man who lives in the sovereign state of New Jersey. He had a bilateral orchiectomy. That means they had to remove both of his testicles. He had a, a prostate cancer and he had testicular cancer and they just had to take those, those uh, organs away. He was 47 years old, he was active. He was a, a guy, he had several children. He was a good guy. And here's how low, when his, when his bone mineral density sunk that low into the osteoporosis range, his doctors said, Miguel, you have to stop doing any weightlifting or anything weight-bearing. It's too dangerous. He got so mad, he quit the doctors, stopped the medicines, and started doing yoga. Next slide. Here we are. Over the next seven years, look what happened to Miguel. Look what happened to his bone mineral density from age, I don't know, 54 to 62, something like that. It went from osteoporosis through osteopenia, clamped straight up. Looks like the, the, over the constellation Orion. And he came out to there. And now he's a yoga teacher. He believes. Now do the next slide. Um, so we did this thousand patient study. And I must tell you, 83% uh, of them got better. I'm reiterating. 
But now we have over 150,000 hours of people doing the yoga. About 83% of them have osteopenia and osteoporosis and no fractures, no serious injuries of any kind. Uh, no uh, sp uh, terrible sprains of the ankle, no herniated discs, uh, no neck problems of any magnitude. Uh, you know, some people get a little sore afterwards, and that's about as bad as it gets. Next slide. Here's one of the ways it works. You saw before how uh, doing this pose was put, put a tremendous leverage on the thigh. Here, uh, Sally is pushing out with her bent knee and pressing in with her straight biceps. She's twisting the right side of her baby out, body outward. So there's torque at the neck and head of the femur. There's lateral pressure on the femur and tibia on the other side. And again, there's that twisting force on the vertebrae. Simple yoga pose using a block, doesn't hurt. Next, po next slide. Here's the one I was looking for. This is what happened. Here these patients are, uh, uh, the, the first little uh, bar you see, that's, what, that's how much bone they gained or lost before they started doing yoga. You can see for the spine, they were losing a lot of bone every two years. And then the lighter colored gray bars, how well they did in the two years while they were doing yoga. The little parentheses, those are the uh, uh, confidence intervals. So that was very significant. Then when it, that's the spine. When it came to the hip, uh, there was a curveball there in that there are different measures for the hip. It's a composite measure. It's not that you know, you turn on the machine and look at the value. Not at all. You have to add different values, and, uh, a different centers constructed differently. So that it's obvious that you build bone. It was not statistically significant. When it comes to the femur, they were losing bone galore before, and they were gaining bone afterwards. Again, easily significant. Okay, uh, let's do the next one. So there's something else that we need to talk about, which is bone quality. The bone mineral density is measured absolutely in the circumference of the bone, the very outside of the bone, the ring around the outside. That's where all the bone mineral density is, but not all the strength of the bone. The little trabeculae that cross, crisscross side to side from uh, the right to the left, they're sort of like diameters and other little sectors of the circle that's made by a bone, supply anywhere from 30 to 70% of the strength of the bone. And using finite element analysis, which is the way engineers measure the strength of the bridge, we looked at 18 yogis in the machine. There are only two of these machines, one's at NYU and one's in Northern Finland where they need it. The sun is such that they have osteoporosis galore. It turns out yoga appears to improve bone quality. These trabeculae that supply sometimes more of the strength of the bone uh, than all the bone mineral density in the world. Now, what do I mean by strength of the bone? It's resistance to fracture. It's ability to sustain trauma and not fracture. Next slide. Here's the place. You see that little circle in the middle? Whereas there's trabecular paucity, there aren't enough. Well, the yogis have a lot more there, exactly because of the poses I was showing you, where there's pressure and tension and torque right there on, on the thigh bone. Next slide. This is what no medicine can do. They can roll the pills across their discs. They ain't gonna give you better posture, balance, range of motion, strength, coordination, and anxiety. Next slide. This is where I was showing you the side effects. And I, I haven't mentioned on the left side, the pleasure of doing yoga as opposed to joint pain, hives, rewards, heartburn, difficulty moving, difficulty breathing, chills, confusion, convulsions, coughs, diarrhea, chest pain. That's just a couple of lines there. Next page. What is so good about yoga? You can do it all your life. It raises, it raises the bone mineral density and the quality. The side effects are good, great for fitness, and it's economic. Next slide. Well, the real bottom line here, you can take a, a screenshot of this if you want to have it, but go to my website, sciatica.org, S-C-I-A-T-I-C-A.org, O-R-G, and you get all of this stuff. It's a whole heading osteoporosis. Uh, you can also get uh, Ellen Salton stalls in my book and stuff like that. Go back, I want to show, no, go on, go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is an ancient saying. Meds, at first, they're like heaven. After a while, they're like poison. Yoga, at first, it may be a little like poison, but after a while, it's like heaven. Next slide. <laughs> Here we are. 
here's the person who does yoga, who is, I think she's certified in my method. Her name is very familiar to me. And she's adorable and darling and good. And she does yoga. Okay, next slide. That's me in black and white. You can see me in ever living color. There's Ron and me and what we do. My website is misrepresented there. It's actually yo sciatica.org. That's what it is. And there's Ron at Ethos Primary Care. Looking cute. Next slide. Then that all slide. Well, all right. You know, it's funny. I timed myself. I came out 31 seconds in advance. So we have time for one, one more question. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to switch it over and make Liz the, the mistress of ceremonies. I'll, 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 I'll narrate this. And Liz is going to show you some of these yoga poses. What we do is we do the yoga poses in three versions, vanilla, chocolate, and lime. No, not really. We do them in three versions, beginner, intermediate, and then the classical pose. And while the classical pose can look a little daunting, the uh, beginner pose, it's like a spectrum. You start where you can do it. The idea is that you, you don't do anything, you don't attempt anything that's going to be dangerous or that's going to be damaging, harmful. So let's just start. Wait, I'm going to make Liz, I'm going to make you big. Okay, you ready? Uh, that ought to do it. Yeah, hi. This is Liz Larson. Hi. And she's going to do some poses. Let's do a chair version. What's happening? You're not. I'm sorry, it didn't work. What do you mean? You're I'm not big? I'm not big. Oh, let's see. Are you still the host? Are you still letting uh, me? I don't mean to. Maybe Wendy is the host. I don't. Wendy, you're still the host. You have to give the host thing back to me. That's what has to happen here. Okay, I can tell when she's done it. She hasn't done it yet. Thank you for interceding this way. Wendy, you understand how to do that? You just go to, to my little picture there. In the upper right corner, you'll see some dots. Click on the dots and it'll say, uh, change host. Go, go to my picture and do that. I see you, but I do not see the dots. Upper right corner. Uh, bring your cursor there and hover. Or you know what you can do without that? Just make Liz, uh, go over to Liz. You see Elizabeth Larson? Wendy, do you where see would she, Where would she be? I don't. Way, way over on the right. Hold on. Um, all participants who can. Advanced sharing office. Um, oh boy. If not, you can just you can go over and make Liz uh, make Liz spotlight. Click on her little dots there, and one of them will be spotlight. I don't see anybody listed. I just see you speaking. Yeah, well, I am speaking, but uh, you speak for a minute, so I'll get small. Say something. Wait a minute. Me. Hold on a second. I see her now. Okay. Good. I apologize for the delay. Now I see me and I want to see Liz. Spotlight. Yeah. There All you right. go. Good. Okay. Nice going, Wendy. Yes. Okay. So this is Liz Larson. We're going to do some poses. And the first one is it's called, in, in Sanskrit, it's called Trikonasana, which is a triangle pose. Very similar to English, the Sanskrit. Liz spreads her arms out to the side. Your arms go way out to the side. Okay. I'm so sorry. Wendy, if you could mute yourself, there's a lot of feedback coming from your microphone. Yeah, oh, Please. good, good. Yeah, Wendy, you just go up uh, and, and mute, make yourself mute. Yeah, good, I think you did it, good. So this is the, the, the beginner version. Liz has her arms out to the side. She's stretching them outside to side as far as they go taking a breath and the arms are sort of floating like the wings of a, of a seagull catching a thermal wide apart. And she takes a breath in and she takes a breath out and she comes down. She descends with her right arm to the seat of the chair. And she's got the, ch the chair there for balance front to back. And she's got the chair there. Uh, she's got the wall there for the balance of, so she doesn't fall backward or forward. So right to left and front to back, she's pretty well supported. See how her arms are in a, 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 a nice, collinear fashion, you can draw a line right from this middle finger to that wrist without ever breaking the line. This can also uh, show other parts that get better in the pose, like re revolving her left knee outwards. See that? The arch rises, the hip goes back, and the, the, the right groin gets wider 
as her abdomen comes away and her left groin gets longer as the hip pulls back towards the wall. Now, what's the tendency here? To rock towards the outside, towards the little toe side of the right foot. So I say to Liz, lengthen your inner leg and watch that foot come down. See it? Okay, now we're gonna show the advanced version. We're just gonna go right to it. Thank you, Liz. The advanced version, you don't use a chair. You don't need the wall. Yeah, your arms are straight out again, stretching as far as you can, stretching your sternum like bubble gum, taking a good breath in and exhaling and coming all the way down. Now here's the important thing here. Why do they call it the triangle? Because it has three triangles, the two legs and the mat, uh, the one leg, the torso and the arm, and the wrist, the ankle and the mat, three triangles. Now the biggest thing that Liz is doing right is that her right back, the right ribs are straight, it, it, it make a straight surface. Liz, show what's wrong, bulge up a little bit, do it wrong. Yes, that's wrong. Now do it right again, it's enough wrongness. Yes, like that. And here too, Liz turns her right knee outward so that the hip comes away from the, the, the abdomen. And so the right groin gets wide and it gets long and the left groin gets wide, wider and wider. What is this good for? It's obviously good for the hip and the femur and it's there's twist in the spine. What more could you ask for? Okay, now come up, we'll show you one more. I wanna show you one that is more balanced than anything else. Here, when you start out, you use the chair and you put your one foot against the chair and the, uh, you, you'll see, this is, a, it's, it's, this is called uh, the tree, Vrikshasana. And Liz breathes in and brings her arms high over her head. Then she stretches up, digging her fingertips into the soundproofing of the ceiling. She can't turn back too much because her right leg is and her right thigh are against the wall. She can't fall forward because the chair is sort of keeping her from doing that. She's not gonna to fall to the left or the right either. So it's really good for keeping yourself, you know, stable and yet learning to be stable without anything keeping you there. Let's show some other versions of this. Uh, turn the chair around the other way and put, put your foot just a little bit up the opposite. Yeah, like that. And now you can use the chair in case you're having trouble side to side in, in spite of the chair. And then as Liz gets better, she can hold onto the chair very lightly so that if she does have problems, she can grasp it. And then eventually she can bring her arm up. Now, a study at USC showed that, in fact, this puts as much pressure on the lateral thigh as having the leg all the way up at the root of the thigh, the way Liz did before. This one's just as good. But it's not as elegant. Now show, let's show the real version. This way you take the, the thigh, the heel way up high. And what does this do? It raises your center of gravity, which actually makes it easier. Because if you start to lose your center of gravity, you can get yourself under it. If your center of gravity is low down and you start to lose it, it's, it's a gone thing, it's gone. Beautiful, very good. Okay, now we're gonna do the hardest one. I always say, if I had to go to a desert island and I, only, I could only take one pose with me, this would be the one. Paravrita Trikonasa, the twisted triangle. First version, you use the chair and this twist, bringing her right arm over the top and the left, uh, yeah, right, right. And the left arm goes down, twisting the thighs together, just the opposite of what we did before. You're scissoring the thighs together. So if you had a piece of tissue paper, you would cut it with your thighs like a scissors. Here, the left heel, you try to get the left heel on the ground. If it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it. But the idea is to twist as much as you can. Is this good for the hips? Is this good for the femur? Is this good for the spine? I think this is, I think, I've improved it. I think this is probably the best of all of them. The others are good. This one is like superb. Even in this version, which is the, the, the beginner version, what can Liz do? She can push outward against the chair to move her left chest towards the wall and push a little bit with the right hand to bring the right shoulder away from the wall. So the left chest goes towards it, the right shoulder pulls away. Lower your left shoulder a little bit, see if you can do it. Yeah, now you're more collinear. Great. Okay, let's see the, let's, let's show them the advanced version. Only going to show you a couple more, so keep your eyes wide. Here we go. This is not using, she's She's standing there facing the wall. She turns one foot out and one foot in. 
she, this, this one too, she brings her left arm over the top and, and, the, and down to the floor. The right one goes behind her. What's the point of having the wall there? The wall is so that Liz, can, it, it has a guide here rather than a support. Liz can feel whether her whole back is against the wall. That's what, you know, ideally the platonic ideal would put her there. Are the, are the thighs squeezed together? Just about as much as they can be. Yeah. Nice pose. You know what, let's show another variation. Let's come up, um, show what we do using the wall, the standing version. You know, some people can't sit. Some people need to do all their poses standing, where one foot is up with the thigh against the wall. Yeah, this is a really nice version. Uh-huh. And then Liz's hands are about at the same level in each case. Uh, both feet are important here. Got to press down a little bit with that right foot too. And then she presses with her left hand to bring her, I mean her right hand, bring her right shoulder away from the wall. And the left chest goes towards the wall. And now what Liz can do with that wall is pull downward so she gets taller. That gives a force upward so that Liz can lift her, her, her ribs off of her abdomen, which gives her much more availability to twist. I just wanted to show that one because I think it's so anybody can do this. Now we're gonna do some where you, you lie down and these require a little more guts, I think, to do. There's the bridge. Liz, you're gonna need a block for this one. Show you the beginning version and then we'll go the whole, yeah, there is a block. First, let's go, let's, yeah, do you see how this goes down? Why? Wow. This goes down in a way that never rounds her back. That's one of the things you can't do either in yoga or elsewhere. Here she is, so if you, okay. And then, and now go down the right way. She's standing there like a regular person. She goes down on one knee, now on both knees. She's on two knees and she goes to one hip. Then she crawls her way down and turns over, never rounding her back. Now her knees are bent, her feet are flat on the floor. She's getting ready, she's recharging the battery. And now she comes up, she pushes down with her feet and comes up so that just that block gets underneath. If you have a teacher, your teacher would do that for you. So now there's a little bit of uh, uh, extension there in the spine, not too much, but there is some. So now what do you do? You keep your forearms vertical and little by little you get up the guts to raise your abdomen off of the block. Maybe just a little, maybe you get tired real fast, Maybe you're unsure of yourself and you come down. And this is the way you start to teach yourself to go from the beginning pose uh, upward toward the intermediate and, and eventually the classic. Now, when Liz comes up now, she keeps going up and down. This, by the way, this pose is also excellent for a herniated disc. You put another block, don't do this Liz, but you put another block between your knees and that works too. Now Liz comes down again. Now I think that's time for the, why don't you put the block between your knees to show them how that goes. Yeah. This is a heavy block. There are lighter blocks that are more propitious for this kind of thing. Now this pushes down with her hands, comes up as far as she can with her body, interlocks her hands behind her, presses down with the little finger side of the hand. And now here's the trick. Don't move your feet, but push them away isometrically. You see how Liz's chest comes up over her throat? That's the real pose. Going up and down like that sort of, what you're doing there is you're opening the front of the vertebrae and it's sort of creating a partial vacuum there, which draws the disc. So there's a herniated disc, it draws it away from the nerves and back under the vertebral bodies where it's supposed to be in the first place. What's the reddest part of Liz? Her head. That's where the blood is, is traveling to the upper part of the lungs and the head. Okay, come on down, Liz. Thank you. We have one more we're going to do. We're going to do a twist, just so I show you. Bharad Vajasana, which is a beautiful pose. <clears throat> You sit down, the best version we can do when you're just learning is to cross your legs like this. You pick your right hand up against the wall. You pick your left hand up against the wall and you move not with your shoulders, but with your lowest, lowest abdomen, your flank. You move your left flank forward towards the wall. See how Alyssa's shoulders are parallel? That's the way it's supposed to be. She's pushing with her right arm to bring that shoulder away from the wall. And she's guiding herself with the left arm so that the left arm stays where it's at, but the chest goes forward. The wall stops and restrains the right thigh from curving out into the space the wall occupies, which will give you that sort of imaginary sense of perfection. You think you're doing it right, but you ain't. 
this is the right way. Okay, that's, I think they see it. Now let's do the, the, the big version. This is the last pose we're gonna do. Sits there, see how the right ankle is cradled in the left, the arch of the left foot. This is straight, she takes her hand, she ex uh, extends the wrist and she twists, she walks behind herself counterclockwise with the left hand and brings the right chest forward and the left shoulder back. This way the torso stays twisted. My great teacher, Mr. Iyengar used to say, all the poses are just vari variations on the mountain pose where you're just standing there and the torso stays relatively unchanged. And you can see that's what's going on here. It's twisted, but it's twisted in its entirety. And she can crawl her hand around like that and grasp her own thigh and get even more of a twist. And also the forearm impels the lowest right ribs forward, which is what we want. Okay, Liz, thank you very much. Yeah, that was really good. Okay, so now I think we're just about at the time. There's a lot of questions to Yeah, oh my, we only have 99 questions which is like 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And I don't <laughs> drink them all. Uh, um, Ron, uh, let's, let me just go, let me just go to the first question. Let's see some of them. How is study of second set going? Somebody wants to know. It's going very well. How many hours a week should one do yoga to help with osteoporosis every day, including uh, Sundays and bank holidays? If you want to do it right, that's the way to do it. Otherwise, uh, you, in our study, we use people who did it more than three times a week, which means more than every other, every other day or more, it meant more than that. So that works, but it's a dose response relationship. You give more penicillin, you kill more streptococci. You do more yoga, you get even stronger bones. Uh, somebody just received the book, a friend. We'll be discussing diet and bone health tonight. I think we are, Ron, I think this is a question for you. Diet and bone health, wait, I'm gonna make, oh, I can't do it. Uh, Asha, you no, not Asha. Wendy, you have to make Ron the center of attention now. I know you can do it. <laughs> Wendy, are you there? I'm here. I'm scrolling over his more button, but it's not doing anything. Uh, well, I can I can answer in any event. Yes, go ahead and answer. Maybe I'll to something here. Yeah, that's better, isn't it? Yeah, you're bigger now. Go ahead. You can hear it? Absolutely. Yes, Dr. Weiss. So um, that is a very common question. Um, and um, so we know uh, when it comes to diet that the, the people who eat the most dairy have the most hip fractures. That was a large uh, Northern European study. Um, what else do we know about diet? We know that uh, caffeine, uh, for example, caffeine that is found in coffee and even tea and in Coca-Cola, um, we know that caffeine acts as a, a calciuretic agent. It causes the kidney to pour out uh, more calcium. Um, and sodium does the same. So we advise our patients uh, not to add, you know, who have osteoporosis or, or osteopenia, not to add salt to their food and to avoid caffeine um, because, of, because we, uh, the kidney is known to put out more calcium into the urine when you consume these substances. Are there rigorous studies that uh, otherwise that show that eating plant, a plant-based diet which is the diet which is recommended for all other health matters, can that help osteoporosis? Um, there are no studies. Uh, what, is, what is my experience over the decades of people who have eaten steadfast plant-based diets, um, who've had um, low bone densities? I have not noticed that it is the foremost, a foremost benefit in reversing osteoporosis. And I've noticed that it is the, the fitness endeavors, and primarily what Dr. Fishman's been talking about, that 
gives the most benefits. Okay, so, I, I want to let me say something that I think may be relevant here too. That uh, the the real advantage to to doing yoga, and the real advantage of this whole really webinar is that it seemed to me that the people who are eating a plant-based diet are the ones whose general life aesthetic is likely to make yoga appealing to them. And the same, the opposite is true too. Those people that are already doing yoga to benefit their bones will find a plant-based diet and the sort of thing you do on your totally non-GMO, I mean, non-GMO farm, your totally biologically pure farm, they'll, they will find that attractive too. It's kind of, I would say it's an ethos. It's like, yeah. Yeah. like an aesthetic that, that, that makes things good for each other. So it, it, it's, it, it, I've never known it to be bad for your uh, bones. I mean, gorillas don't suffer from osteoporosis very terribly, you know, even though their diet is largely plant-based. Same is true with the um, you know, koala bears. So I agree with you. It's, it, it is not, it definitely is not bad, but I, we, there are no studies that show that it can reverse osteoporosis. That's why with our patients, we, we use the plant-based diets to uh, attack all other aspects of chronic disease, to prevent Alzheimer's, to prevent heart attacks and strokes and autoimmune diseases and, and, and hypertension and, and diabetes and reverse all of these things. But we, the primary tool in our, our primary arrow in our quiver when it comes to osteoporosis is your poses. And not to say that we, we don't encourage everyone, of course, eat plants because of what I just said, because mm -hmm. it is part of that. It's, it's part of the whole shebang. But uh, here, Here's uh, another question from Julie out in California. Uh, a patient who's taking a, a, an aromatase inhibitor, an astrozole. This is uh, like people take this who have breast cancer and prostate cancer because they don't want the, uh, uh, the, the hormones that have anything to do with um, gender, the gender-based hormones, because those stimulate uh, those tumors to grow. So they take something to sort of tamp down those tumors and that by tamping them down, they tamp down one of the chief stimuli for, for bone growth, the, which are the, st the steroids and the steroid-like medicines, such as testosterone and estrogen. And so the, her question is, uh, can, can yoga work for people that, uh, that have this? And the answer is yes. I'm, I'm doing a talk just a week from, a week from tonight on a group of prostate survivors who have metastatic disease, very, very sick people who are fabulously interested in this because it, it's, it's for them, it's about their only recourse. Now let's and see. I, I would add one step further, Dr. Fishman. Sure. That there are many, in, in addition to the yoga practice to strengthen the bones, there are <laughs> many nutritional uh, advantages to having a highly medicinal plant-based diet because there are many plants that have been shown in studies to help, um, to help increase survival in breast cancer patients, uh, especially estrogen positive patients, mm -hmm. like ones who take anastrozole. Uh, it's important to remember that, that anastrozole originally was extracted from mushrooms. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> Is that right? Yes, you can eat mushrooms and get those aromatase inhibitors. Isn't that interesting? You can eat flaxseed and, and decrease the aggressivity of your tumor marker. Of your tumor. Oh, you eat soy and, and make your BRCA genes more uh -huh. powerful to suppress tumor cells. You can eat cruciferous vegetables and increase your chance of survival by 30%. Just each one of those items. You can eat beets and those beets will bind secondary bile acids in your colon, which are more powerful than estrogen at promoting breast cancers. You can do all of these things and even more. And I encourage you to do that if you've had a diagnosis. What a wealth of knowledge that is. That's great, Ron. Now here's somebody, here's Jean, who uh, I went to OsteoStrong for 18 months and my results were insignificant. She has a, a face, you know, one of those. <laughs> that looking for, yeah, she didn't do, didn't do that well. Uh, do either of you have an opinion on Algae Cal Plus? I do, because I uh, I studied a little bit, and uh, it it uses 
uh, calcium that comes from algae, which some people feel is, is too bad to steal the algae away from those little white one-celled critters that need it to live, and, and slightly larger the plankton and so on. Uh, but it, it's, it's pure, that's for sure. And uh, it does lead to uh, increasing your bone mineral density, it does. Now, the question is whether it leads to it because one of the other things that are in it uh, is, is um, the, the ranolate, the strap, uh, a, a ranolate compound, which is uh, known to produce bone mineral density rise. So it's not clear whether it's the algae or whether it's the, it's the, the strontium ranolate that is making the, the increase there. But it does work, to whichever element it is, it does seem to work. Uh, now here's another one. I've been going to OsteoStrong for one year now and my bone density improved greatly as did my overall strength. Um, uh, okay, they're commenting on uh, sound quality here. That doesn't mean much. Uh, there's too much, too much about the sound quality. A lot of these questions are not really questions. They're, they're compound, they're, they're uh, comments. Uh, Dr. Fishman, if I may, I see a question directed towards Dr. Weiss. Um, just a clarification. Did you say that people who eat more dairy have the most hip fractures? Yes, in a, it was a large, uh, it was a, a large study which showed that the people who eat the most dairy have the most hip fractures kind of a dose response relationship too, wow. isn't it? Okay, so now I'm, I'm still going through and there's all kinds of talk about uh, uh, the, the quality of the, of the speech. Um, and nothing there's very much about <laughs> the subject at hand. So now, will this recording be shared? Yes, I'm gonna take the URL from this recording, such as it is, and put it on my website, sciatica, dot org and it'll be there tomorrow morning it takes the zoom a couple of hours to process it and this is a long one so it'll take them a little longer i'm sure i'll put it there and then you'll be able to click on it um and now i'm going through these there's uh, another one for dr weiss uh-huh go ahead uh, supplements on d3 how much does uh is recommended plant-based calcium plant-based calcium with uh, strontium and how much d3 somebody else also inquired what is the maximum amount of d3 that you recommend dr weiss hmm. well you know those are all wonderful questions my general approach is that i'm not a big supplement taker and the reason why is because i i believe that in general if if you're having an, an excellent diet, it should provide for um, all the all the minerals uh, that are necessary and to build strong bones. Um, so that excellent diet is uh, of whole plant foods, and it is a diverse diet that incorporates many different kinds of plants into the diet. That having been said, so. That, that's where we get our calcium from. That's where we get our magnesium. That's where we get our phosphorus. That's where we get our vitamin K. That's where we get, you know, all the, the manganese. That's where we get these minerals that we need to build our bone. The one thing we really can't get it from the diet is the vitamin D. And that's why we recommend that people go out into the sun and get safe sun exposure. Um, uh, because the sun does many things uh, that are good for us, uh, aside from giving us vitamin D. It, it can do bad things for you if, if the sun exposure is abused and if you're not on a plant-based diet. But in general, it is a good thing. And uh, that having been said, if we have people who are in, trapped in office buildings or, or for one reason or another, Sometimes I, I do have patients who have melanomas or other malignancies of the skin in their past history. Sometimes we, we do give them uh, vitamin D and the average person, you know, would get uh, about 2000 units of vitamin D3 daily. And that general alone, that general dose is enough to bring the vitamin D level up to, I found in the thirties 
uh, and supposedly between 30 and 100 is, mm -hmm. is, is, is the normal range. However, we don't know if that's the optimal range. And uh, just as an aside, because we are in a pandemic now, there was a very interesting study that was printed about two years ago in the British Medical Journal, which indicated that a level of vitamin D near 50 is best at preventing respiratory viral illnesses, including from some coronaviruses, not the SARS-2 coronavirus that we have because we didn't have it back then, but for many other respiratory viruses. So at this time, we try to have our patients get to a level of 50, especially due to the coronavirus epidemic. And, and if I do have somebody who has osteoporosis, I try to shoot for that range as well. What, what do you do, doctor? No, I, I usually advise 1,500 international units. It's pretty close. And um, we have some patients, when we do our studies, we measure, it's one of the parameters we measure. They can't be in the study if they don't have at least a normal value. So that, and I, I, I find that uh, what I've read about is that the sun screens, the various stronger sunscreens with the higher numbers above 30 or so, actually prevent the conversion of vitamin D2 to vitamin D3. So that if you're, if you're out in the sun and using a sunscreen to prevent a burn or a melanoma, you're not getting the sun you need. So that's an important factor in it. And a study I saw, they did it in Budapest, uh, where they wanted to know in the winter how much sun an adolescent needs in order to maintain good bones. And it turned out it was a half an hour of the noonday sun that they needed. And there's only one thing the scientists... It's the, the, it's well, not it's not much, but the scientists had a lot of trouble because they, they haven't figured out yet how to stop the sun so it stays there for a half hour. <laughs> so here's somebody who says, a member of the ACLM, and says, I'm thrilled you both are having this conversation. We need everyone to be involved in changing the paradigm. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's sort of one of the points here is that we feel that there's an awful lot of cross ventilation here, an awful lot of cool, pleasing vibes coming back and forth here. And we should, we should be happy with that. What is the name of the study about soup to pee? Oh, uh, it's in the Journal of Physiology, published July 1st, 2020. Uh, I would appreciate hearing the names of all the asana in both Sanskrit and English. Too late, I'm sorry. Um, now they're talking about, is, how is, func this is for you, Ron. How is functional medicine similar to lifestyle medicine? Hmm. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in functional medicine. Uh, but, um, so I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that, but I, uh, from what I can t tell, and I don't want to go to, you know, I know what I know. Uh, I, I think that, um, I can tell you that functional medicine seems to, from, from what I can tell, it seems to focus on the evaluation of individuals with uh, in-depth testing to sort of find molecular derangements and then to try to address them, sometimes with supplements. Um, and um, it is not, it, as far as I can see, it is not, it does not dwell in those seven pillars, those core areas that I told you about, especially not diet. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, the lifestyle medicine, it is an evidence-based uh, pursuit. So uh, when we make these recommendations for di diet, um, there's a lot of evidence that back it up. Or if we make this, that's why I love you, Dr. Fishman, because we, you present the evidence for how these yoga poses uh, prevent and reverse you know, osteoporosis and, and bone demineralization. So mm, I think perhaps that's what lifestyle medicine has going for it. Mm -hmm. it, it has a deep evidence um, basis to it. Well, here's, all another, here's, a, here's another question from Carol for you. Uh, another Carol. 
Dr. Weiss, how do you address emotional health? You know, one of the pillars in lifestyle medicine, which I think is right up the street of, of the last question. Yeah. So, um, so I think that emotional health can be uh, 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 greatly impacted by attention to each of the other six pillars. Diet, for example. Well, there's evidence that eating whole plant foods completely rearranges the gut microbiome. And if you have the right complement of bacteria in your gut, uh, those bacteria can elaborate more serotonin than any Prozac pill or Lexapro. <laughs> And, and those, those antidepressants and anti-anxiety medicines are, are basically that type, focus on increasing those neurotransmitters. Um, fitness, of course, we know that there are excellent studies that show that uh, running, for example, can, can have as much efficacy at combating depression than does the serotonin reuptake. Of course, I'll, I'm going to leave, you know, you talked about anxiety before Dr. Fishman and its effect, uh, yoga's effect on that. Uh, social connection, of course, uh, uh, decreases ice, the individual's isolation. And, 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 and of course, that would have a, a beneficial effect on anxiety, depression. Avoidance of central nervous system depressants like alcohol and, and drugs, of course, that would improve um, depression. Sleep, of course, is, is, a, is called the Swiss army knife of our health. So it's important to get that sleep. And of course, connection to the natural world, which is, is very important for psychological conditions as studies have shown is important. Well, that's, that's the wonderful thing is that some of the greatest advances in public health and in personal health of the 20th century have been these things that everybody, that are right available to at everyone's fingertips. Exercise for, for heart health, um, uh, meditation to, to reduce hypertension. And now I think you're hitting on the third one that's coming up in this century, sleep. There's no tax on sleep. You don't have to go to a fancy pharmaceutical firm to get it, but it isn't always that easy. No. Now here's someone, many people are clamoring for you to talk about something you already mentioned, which is, uh, you, uh, what medicines, are, what, what foods are good for osteoporosis, which you've already said, that's one of those things, food alone won't do it. It's like an old I Danish think the primary, thing. The primary tool is loading. Loading and, and building, you know, uh, trying to augment that Wolf's Law and trying to build that bone density, the trabeculi strengthen them, the outer ring of bone, work on that. And I think food can be an ally you know, you certainly don't want to drink a, a lot of acids and soda and smoke cigarettes and drink a lot of caffeine and salt. That would be harmful. But I think, yeah, we've discussed that. Okay, here's another one um, for you. We're getting, Dr. we're getting, I know we're getting close to the end here. It's almost another half hour. Can lifestyle medicine suggest anything different from Eliquis to thin the blood naturally? This is from Christina. Well, yes. So lifestyle medicine, uh, when it comes to diet, is very powerful in thinning the blood. For example, people who eat high-level plant-based diets have the equivalent of an, an 81 milligram aspirin pill in their blood. If, if you were to draw uh, my blood, I eat a high-level plant-based diet, and check it for aspirin, even though I've never taken a baby aspirin, you would find the equivalent of an aspirin in there. No kidding, you see this? Oh, this plants like have, and plants have a lot of other things that anticoagulate the blood. That's why plant-based eaters have less like, likelihood to get blood clot. However, however, I must caution you. There are specific reasons why people take Eliquis and, and, and other kinds of blood thinners. And they're usually to pre prevent devastating events. For example, if you have atrial fibrillation to prevent a blood clot and a stroke in your head. And the studies have never, ever been done to prove that just eating plants can replace that. So what I would do if I were you is if you are on a very good reason for taking Eliquis, 
I would take it and I would eat your plants. That's a pretty safe medicine after all. It truly, it truly is. Now I have a question for you. When you say whole plant diet, do you mean the whole plant, you know, the roots and the stems and the twigs and the leaves and is that what you mean? What is whole plant? The whole, that's an excellent question. The whole refers to not processed, uh -huh. not extracted. So mm -hmm. for example, if we eat blueberries, I'm not going to be eating the twigs and the leaves. They, <laughs> although they may not poison me, they're not really palatable. Not nutritional. So, nutritional. Right. If, if I eat an olive, you know, I will eat that whole olive. That is a whole plant food. But if I press it and I extract oil from it, that oil is not a whole plant food. I it's see. I harmful see. to our health. So we concentrate on eating whole plant foods. I see. So would you consider that it's bread is a processed food? It's not a whole plant it food. It is a processed food. Uh -huh. It is a processed food. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, uh, so... Uh, if you take uh, if you take a, a, a very simple bread that's made from whole sprouted wheat berries and it just has yeast and water and mm. it's got to have salt because who would eat bread if it didn't have salt? It would be tasteless. So it, it usually has some salt in it. That would pr probably be about the simplest bread that you could eat. Of course, because it was made from flour, the wheat berries were ground up. It's no longer a whole plant food. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are lots of other questions here. So I have a question about the program now called Osteo Strong that is in several large cities. Boy, they're really into this. It's machines to strengthen bone. Well, I think you've heard something about that from both of us, uh, that it certainly works sometimes. Two out of three of the people that have answered here have found that it works. What do you think about the role of micronutrients in treating osteoporosis? Well, I think you've heard that. Can you tell us again where Dr. Weiss is? And his lifestyle medicine program, tell them. <laughs> yes, so uh, we are located an hour west of Manhattan, from New York City, uh, right down Route 80 and Route 78 in a beautiful green valley. It's called Long Valley, New Jersey, Morris County. Uh, I practice medicine here in New Jersey and New York. I have a, a New York and New Jersey medical license. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's not a long drive from New York. It's only an hour, and it's, it's actually like a little vacation here. Uh, we also do telemedicine visits. So if, if you do not want to leave Manhattan for some reason, you're always welcome to schedule a telemedicine visit. Would you ship whole plants to Manhattan? Can you do that? Can you put it in a so box? Our, our farm market, our, uh, we, we grow our plants regeneratively, which is uh, levels above organic certification. And our, we have a farm market that's open to the public. Anyone can come on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. It's open. Uh, so you can come. And there are great, beautiful things to do around the farm. So make it a day. Come to the farm market. Unfortunately, at this time, we do not ship the food. Uh -huh. Okay. If I may, we're running out of time. And this seems like a perfect place to segue. We are having an open house for people who would like to visit our farm next Wednesday, which is on our website, ethosprimarycare.com. And for everybody who joined us this evening, if you have a question for Dr. Fishman, you can email carol at sciatica.com uh, org, or you can uh, email events and at ethosprimarycare.com, and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, we also will be sending an email with a special offer for everybody who's joined us this evening as well, for anybody who wants to visit with Dr. Weiss. Well, that's great. Now, I want to, as long as you're talking about your open house, I want to say we are having a, uh, a four-hour uh, gala celebration on August 1st where we're going to go through all three versions of the poses that seem to reverse osteoporosis in all their variations. So you get all the beginner versions and all the intermediate versions, all the classical versions, and some surprises about what happens, how, how yoga works with the bones and with other things. So you go to sciatica.org and you get that. So I think this has been, uh, I, I hope people have gotten something out of this. Uh, Someone, they're asking questions on all kinds of things from you and from me. I'm getting a question here about scoliosis. I probably can't answer all the questions. Ron, I don't, I don't know if you can either. 
I, I think I probably could send you a list of all of them if you like. I'm not even sure I can do that, but I suppose I could. Anyway, to all and every, you know, in, in America, we give the high five. In India, we give the high 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Dr. Fishman. The same Thank here. It's been a pleasure bye. for you too. Take care. Goodbye, everybody. Thank I'm you, everybody. Bye-bye. Well, Wendy, you have to turn it off because you're still in charge here. Okay, will do. Good night. Good night. Good night.